Thanks, Emily. Thanks, team. So we're on to our first part of the sermon today, and we're continuing our series in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, looking at the church together, uh, the mess of community together, but what we can learn. So I encourage you to open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10. We'll be looking at that today. We've got sermon notes, either um, paper copies are around or um, this time I did press publish, so you will be able to get it online. Two weeks ago, I forgot to press the publish button and people were going, why can't I get my notes online? <laughs> Thanks, Heather, yeah, <laughs> you highlighted it to me. So they're there. Uh, and there's, there's so much actually today I wanted to say that I have put a few different notes in there or, or references to, to some of the things I'm talking about. Of course, as I mentioned, two, two weeks ago we were talking about 1 Corinthians 8 and idolatry and, and we had the combined service with Raj. And um, it's been interesting that actually from that time um, as a church and, and the eldership have been looking at uh, hires and, and we've actually had a couple of requests for different Hindu uh, events uh, which we've had to say no and I guess work through that and, and we're still working through our best to say that to people. But yeah, it's something that we've got to work out together. How do we not be a stumbling block? And, and for the Nepalese church, they're particularly in that world of, of idolatry and, and other gods. And we don't see it as clearly for us, but it's something that's becoming more evident. And today, and, and so last week, Anne and Matt um, really focused on, on uh, Paul talking about his freedom and how he, he would show um, that as an example for his life, how he lived in freedom and restraint. And this time, uh, Paul's using some examples from the past to highlight uh, some of the things that Israel learnt uh, being a community, some of the freedoms and restraints that they need to show. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians 10, and I'm going to read from verse 1, but what Paul is really saying in this first bit is that the need for it to exercise greater discipline and restraint in following God alone. And, he, and here's some examples he gives. In verse 1 he says, For I do not want to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They all were baptised into Moses, into the cloud and into the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink for, the drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, the rock that was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered into the wilderness. What, what's he saying here? There's some pretty big ideas, really. He's actually, Paul here is overlapping the covenant that we know of, of the Old Testament, of Moses, that, he, that the Israelites learnt as they travelled through the wilderness, with the new covenant of Jesus. He's, over, he's overlapping there those, those two um, covenants, as well as uh, the, the idea of, of Christ's death um, before and after the event, which is a whole other sermon <laughs> I don't have time to go into. But um, there's some big ideas here. But I really want to focus on that last one there. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Because what we notice here is that, that many of them, even though they had these big acts, of, these big powerful signs of, of God and, and his provision, they still wandered. They still struggled to follow God. Their hearts were not quite in it. And they chose... Yeah, they chose not to follow God and not restrain themselves from other short-term pleasures. And we're going to read a bit more about them in the next um, few, cha a few verses. But I guess I want to just relate that to our own context a bit with some of the powers and things that we see today. Because like Paul is saying here um, to the Corinthians, we, we have the spiritual drink, we being communion. We have um, signs of, of God's power through the cross and through the Holy Spirit that is with us. But I don't know about you, but I, I can still struggle sometimes to, to remember these things and to follow these things, inspire me in these things. And I wanted to actually give you a couple of examples from my life that I think highlight this. Um, some of you would know that I, I did a, a program called the Arrow Le Emerging Leaders Program. And one of the subjects we were looking actually at Moses and how he... Uh, in his leadership, how he, he came up with all different kinds of excuses, but still, at the end of the day, his, his commitment to follow God in that. And as I thought about that, I kind of said to the director at the time, 
Well, look, I reckon if I had a, a burning bush moment, I'd find it a bit easier to follow God. <laughs> it, it'd be easier to know, you know, if I was told this is what you're going to do and I'm going to be with you in this and I'm going to be with you in this and I'm going to be with you in this, then I reckon I'd have the courage to, to follow wherever God would want to send me. And the director turned around and said to me, so you've never experienced a miracle. You've never experienced God. I was like, whoa, actually, <laughs> I've already forgotten all the times that God has shown up and, and done things in my life. In that moment, I was, I was going, you know, if he showed me this, I would be able to do it. But that, then I was reminded, well, actually, there is all these signs along my journey that God has, has turned up, has provided, has, has um, uh, helped break me from, from different temptations and things. Yet isn't it funny how quickly we can forget some of those things? Another, I think some of the reason why we do forget is I just want to give you another example. Who's, who's been to Boat Harbour Beach up on the northwest? Yeah, a few hands here, I don't know, online and, and over at Mornington. I, I grew up in, in Wynyard and so going to the beach always involved a wetsuit. <laughs> if you, if those that know Boat Harbour Beach, it's very cold. But uh, one summer we had our youth night there uh, at the beach and I, it must have been pretty early on when I'd just moved from being involved in or being a youth member to then being a leader because I was one of the first times organising some of the events and, and I organised this beach sprint uh, and so we had all these different heats but I wanted to be involved, I didn't want to miss out, you know I'd been involved in youth, I wanted to, to get amongst it so of course I set up this, this final and we had the race and I was like great alright I'm going to race the winner now and so of course who won? I won because this other person had just done three races and, and I just stepped in wanting to, you know, show that I could still win. I'll tell you what, that memory makes me shiver. I cringe when I think of how arrogant I was to... But, but I think about two and I didn't want to miss out. I, I had a fear, like FOMO, fear of missing out. I, I, I guess I was in that kind of, I didn't want to miss out on being part of the group. And, and I guess why I highlight that is I think a lot of the time we can fear missing out or fear what other people think of us than missing out on what God has for us. Missing out on, on yeah, what, what we want to see happen for him. I, I know a lot of the times I, f I fear or I think more about what other people think of me than I do God. And that clouds out and I think that does make it yeah, cloudy to, to remember the good things God's done because we... We are already looking around, what's, how can I be involved in this group next or, or we fear missing out. And that can be all different things. Like that for me, that was being admired or celebrated in that moment. But we can fear missing out on our, our dream house or our, our car or, or family or social events, uh, sports, really anything that's, that's pleasing our needs or, or our body. We can, we can fear missing out on those things which is what Israel was doing. It was wanting to have those short-term pleasures, didn't want to miss out on, on the other uh, countries around them, didn't want to miss out on, on the pleasures that were available instead of following God. And so when we come now to verse 6 to 10, it takes a bit of a different tone. And so let's read from verse 6. It says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down and ate and drank and got, got up and indulged in revelry. And so that's referring to Israel setting up the golden calf in Exodus 32. In verse 8, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. This is referring to Numbers 25, 1 to 9. And verse 9, we should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These, again, these events are referenced in Numbers 21, where, where people grumbled against God's provision that he'd given them. So I think it's important to pause in this moment and acknowledge that there's some pretty heavy words. You know, we... We know God is love, but we ask the question, particularly looking at the Old Testament, where is love in these passages? But, you know, Christ, it, yeah, God sending his son, Christ, to die for us, that's not just for us, that's for the Israelite community as well, it's, it's, it's for all of us. 
And we can see here the importance that, that God is a holy God. He invites us to be holy. He invited the Israelites to pursue holiness. And, and I think when we step outside of that path towards holiness, even then, God is faithful and he provides a path back to him. But a lot of times we still can ignore that path. And especially when we then cause others to stumble. You know, Paul was talking about that um, in the couple of um, chapters back. That when our actions, because we've turned our back on God, causes others to stumble, well, that is, and turn away from the cross, well, that is certainly when we put judgment on ourselves. And that's what Israel was doing. They had brought judgment on themselves because it wasn't just them, it, they were leading others away from God. And that's what Paul is wanting to warn against to the Corinthian church and to us. Uh, to satisfy the things that we want right now, instead of waiting on God's provision, they, they cause us to, to, to walk away from God. And there's many modern idols that can, can do that. I mean, today, whenever we allow uh, our relationship to, to things in our society um, that fascinate us or, or compete for our loyalties or, or our priorities and take the place of God, I, it's funny how whenever you... you uh, this is a couple of times I've prepared a sermon like this, and, and you just get challenged yourself on what are the priorities right now that are actually the things I prefer to be doing than writing this <laughs> because um, I know last night even I was like, oh, I don't really feel like getting up here and, and sharing and there's other things I'd like to be doing. But uh, I was saying that to Matt this morning and we're saying really time management is, is our idol management, is, is what are the things that are taking our time and energy um, away from what actually God wants for us which again is because we've forgotten how good it is to be in the presence with God, to be doing the things with our Lord. We're going to be asking the question in the discussion time in a moment, what are the idols uh, that, that you have overcome in your life and, and what are the idols that you need to overcome? And if I want to challenge you, maybe if you've, if you've zoned out right now, what are the things that your mind's gone to? <laughs> because maybe that gives you a bit of a hint as to, to the things that are more on your heart than, than God. But yeah, just like I shared, that it's quite easy to, to have forgotten the things that God has done and to grumble, isn't it? When, when we forget those things, then, then serving God becomes too much effort. It becomes a bit of a grumble, which again can lead other people to join in that grumbling and walk and go in a different direction to what God wants. And that's what we've seen with, with Israel. It becomes too much effort to serve God, to lay down the things that we may enjoy in the short, short term, like, like money, a relationship, sex, the internet, TV, alcohol, eating, or even just control. Because if we focus too much on those things in the short term, then they lead us away from God and leading away from being part of his kingdom. And these are all things that are, that are tempting for us. So that's why Paul, in this final few verses, says, and we probably have heard these words a bit more often than the rest of what we've read today, but in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 to 13, it says, These things happened to them as an example, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the calgamation cal of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. We've heard those words, haven't we? But what, what stands out to you this time, hearing it in the context? We've just been talking about the community of Israel we're talking here about the church of Corinth, us as a church. Let me read those words again. And God is faithful. He will not let you, the church, a collective, be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I think so often we, we personalise that, that, that verse to be in the heat of being tempted, that God will provide a way out and I've got to just pray harder or trust more and, and that will happen. And in my experience, 
It's when I keep my eyes on Jesus and when I actually confess and talk to people about the things that I'm struggling with, that's when there's a way out and that's when we can endure. And I, I think here Paul's telling the church that you're in this together. It's, it's something that, uh, yeah, you need each other in uh, to, uh, to face any temptations that you face, to be able to walk together, to keep our eyes on Jesus and be reminded of, of the many miracles that are in your life that you can trust on. Don't forget them. Hold on to them and remember actually the power and the provision that God has for you. See, Jesus is our only source of freedom and it takes restraint sometimes to, to focus on that. It means remembering the things that God has already done in your life and fearing not missing out on more, on more of what God has for us because there is so much more that he can give. I, I just thought it would be good to finish on this passage. It's still Paul talking to the Corinth church but in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 8. We usually talk about this in the sense of, of giving and offering but as I read the, the whole passage, I think it's more than that. I think it's relevant for for not just giving our, our, our money, but also our, our hearts and our lives to God. It says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I just feel like, what's the opposite to grumbling? It's, it's being a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you are bound in every good work. I just wanted to encourage you with that, that we need to remember the journey that, that God is with us in and, and the commitment that we need to give to him uh, and the, to resist things that want to steer us away from that path. So now I just want to encourage you to move into a discussion time. So those same questions there, what are some of the idols that you have overcome in your life and what are the idols that you still need to overcome? I want to encourage you, those around tables and, and in rows, just to, to find someone around you. Feel free to go where the conversation goes. You don't have to stick to those questions exactly. But in the spirit of it, I want to encourage you to, to share what has been a journey for you and what's been those examples that stick in your mind that help inspire you to, to keep following Christ with all that you have. Thanks. I'd like to bring a prayer from this book, Tides and Seasons. God of love and forgiveness, save me by your tenderness from each deed of evilness, from each act of sinfulness, from each thought of carelessness, from each idea of wickedness, from each word of hurtfulness from each speech of harmfulness save me by your tenderness god of love and god of forgiveness amen thanks anne and uh thanks anne for playing on the keys as well so we move to a time of communion now as we unpack what Paul has been uh, writing. And now he actually turns his attention to communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. As Dan has just pointed out, he's made it very clear that it's possible for Christians to be serving the wrong God. It's possible for Christians to be serving the wrong God. That you can put all kinds of other things before Jesus and he's warning them saying he's giving them some examples he's saying uh, sometimes you can put sexuality and sex in front of Jesus sometimes you can put grumbling in front of Jesus you can put all kinds of things in front of Jesus and then he says my dear friends in verse 14 flee from idolatry I speak to sensible people judge for yourselves what I say Dan gave us a list of all kinds of things that can be idols in your life. And I think he's right when he says, I think how you manage your time is a good indication of what your idols may be. It may not hurt to review the last week in your life and work out what your priorities are and were. 
and, and uh, where they came from. Now, communion is the reminder of the true source of our life and the fact that none of us are meant to live a life solely on the basis of our desires. Communion is a reminder, and we all need the reminder, of the true source of our life and the fact that none of us are meant to live life solely on the basis of our desires. Paul says, think about the people of Israel in verse 18. Do not those who eat sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I don't want you to be participants with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You can't have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? What he's saying is, while idols, whatever our idols are, and he makes this really clear, they have no power in themselves, the forces that want you to put them above God do have power and are serious. There is nothing wrong with a nice new car or a new house or there's nothing wrong with a relationship or being financially stable. Nothing wrong with those things. But the moment they take the place of Jesus, that is serious. And Paul is wanting Christians to understand just how serious it is. All our idols promise life. Have you noticed that? All the things you think you'll find life in, they promise life, but ultimately they produce death. You won't find life anywhere else. Jesus knew how we worked and he gave us this regular reminder that the world revolves around him and it's him and his blood and his body that give us life and nothing else. So wherever you are, if you're at home, I invite you to grab a bicky or a piece of some juice. If you're at Lena Valley or Mornington, grab our COVID safe uh, cup and wafer. And look, in the survey, we've heard some feedback about people not liking the COVID safe cup and, and are looking forward to us not needing to use it. And so I think so will most of us. Um, but this is what Je Jesus instituted this because he knew, if I can just get through the, the seal here, there we go. Uh, Jesus knew that we would need to be reminded. Every morning we wake up with our eyes on ourselves and we need help to lift our eyes to look at him. So as we come now, he said, this is my body broken for you. And he invites us to... Eat this in remembrance of him. Let's eat together. And Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the cup and said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink. Jesus, we recognise it's only through you we can find life. Help us repent, please, of the places where we try and find life that aren't of you. Help us see the idols, we pray, that are in our lives and causing us angst and bringing us away from you. Jesus, help us come to the foot of your cross and discover in a fresh way where life is actually found. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. That's what Paul wanted us to hear in 2 Corinthians 10. And 
I think one of the we live. Would you agree we live in a confusing world? There's all kinds of opinions about how things are meant to happen and not happen. And what Paul is doing in chapter ten of two Corinthians is laying down some big rocks, laying down some some reference points. When I got to the top of Mount uh, Mount Ossa with the boys, almost killed me. But I, uh, and and I was half dead at the top. But um, Mark pointed out that there's a, a survey mark on the top of one of the rocks there that says this is this is the this is the marker point. This is the survey point. I think what Paul's doing is laying down a survey point. He's saying one of the principles or ethical frameworks in your life is there is to be no God other than God. That's what Exodus 20 verse 3, that's the first of the Ten Commandments. You will have no other gods before me. Because we grew up in the Western world, we, we, don't, we heard from Raj a couple of weeks ago, they actually talk about idols. We don't talk about it so much, it's not quite as trendy. But, I don't know, can you identify the things in you that, are, are, that take your attention away from who God is? Chances are, as Dan was saying, they are your idols and we need to talk more about idolatry. Paul is saying this is a big plank. You, in order to live your life as a follower of Jesus, you need to be alert to the idols. And this is a the theme right the way through this letter and through his writing. It's easy for us to tune out to that, but I actually think we need to tune into it because it's a, it's a particularly, there are all kinds of idols the advertising industry is an idol manufacturing business. And one handy household hint, if you want to know what your idols may be, if you'd say, my life would be better if I had. And if the answer isn't Jesus, then chances are. Now, he goes on, so that's one big plank, one big reference point he puts in, down, he goes on to lay down another one. When he says, I've got the right to do anything you say, but not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. And then he lays down one of the, the principles that is a, another big rock. And again, it's probably something you're not going to want to hear when he says this. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. What he's saying here is two big planks to navigate your life by. Over here, make sure you have no other God than God. But here, live for others from the point of view of love. Because if you're not living for others, guess who you are living for? And ultimately, that means you're putting yourself as God. It's the ultimate idolatry. We've said it over again, and this is where Paul really brings it home. He says, in Christ we find freedom. But... As we discover the freedom that only Christ can bring, we discover we are invited to use that freedom to lay down our lives for the sake of others. Paul says, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising a question of conscience. He's saying, go for it. He actually says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You don't have to worry if an unbeliever asks you to come to a dinner and you want to go, eat whatever is put in front of you without raising questions of conscience. And of course that was a huge thing for the Jewish people because the whole thing's about what you can eat and can't eat, that, that's huge. And he's saying none of that matters. He's saying it's not what you do. God made the whole world and it is good. As long as Jesus is first. He says, but, and this is the but, if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it. Both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For 
why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? What he's saying is you may feel absolutely right that you should be able to do something. That you finally have saved up enough money to do something that you've wanted to do your whole life, or you, you finally can eat the, the you know, whatever it is, or what you might you might feel absolutely justified. But what he's saying, if if your choice damages another person, that's serious. Your it isn't again. This is so countercultural. Your inner sense of what is right and what is wrong is not the main thing. You are to choose your behaviour based on the impact of your behaviour on the people around you. Can you? Is there a part of you that's almost going, "What? I don't want that." Really? I want to be true to myself. Well, Paul would be saying, yeah, that's the problem. You've got to be true to Jesus. He actually says, if I take Mark part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? He's saying, you might even think that what you're doing is in the name of God. (laughs) You might be, you know, blessing it and praying for it and doing it for God. But sometimes even the things you know God has given you or the things you want to do for God need to be sacrificed for the sake of other people. And some people will want to give you a list of rules and regulations about how this works. So, and depending on your history, sometimes that's appropriate. Some people know they have a problem with alcohol, so they make a, a, a very clear choice to have a policy of not getting into al- alcohol, or they're people who work with people with problems of alcohol, and they have a very clear life policy, but mostly you can't live by policy. Because one thing that, one way of acting that helps one person may actually do damage to another person. I still remember my dad uh, made a choice not to drink because of the people he worked with. I still remember going with him to the Hornsby Tip. I was a little kid, and and we used to love going to the tip and looking for treasures. Uh, and there was a whole community that that came and combed over the tip. And I still remember the moment they had like a Christmas party for the people that hang around the tip. I had a fantastic childhood. Um, <laughs> and, and this old bedraggled guy came and offered my dad a, a, a can of cold KB. I don't know, we didn't have a KB beer ever made it down here. It was a, a very, it's not very popular these days, I don't think it exists anymore. And I was watching my dad because I knew, I, I think I was about eight at the time, I was watching very closely. And because I, I knew he was hitting a moment of crisis, he had a policy decision to make to face. And so, uh, instead of saying no, no, that's you know, that's not how it works for me, he actually shook the bloke's hand and and took the beer. Uh, and then walked around for the next hour or so with the beer in his hand, which is what you do uh, at one of those parties. It's just no one really noticed the fact he'd never opened the top of it. It is actually important to not live by policy but to live on the basis of the people you're living with. And what what does that mean? It means you need empathy. In order to understand the impact of your behaviour on other people, you need empathy. We've talked about this before. Uh, It was actually a, a nursing a writer about nursing had seen that all sorts of work had been done about empathy. Lots of people have different opinions about it and she dragged it all together and said that there are four aspects to empathy. The first aspect is that you need to be able to see the world as others see it. You need not, it's so easy isn't it to judge people who act in ways that we think they shouldn't act. Say no, Paul's saying no you don't get to do that, you actually got to put yourself in their shoes. 
You need to be non-judgmental. You need to understand other people's feelings and you need to be able to communicate that understanding. That's what this nursing uh, paper says about the, the themes of, of empathy. And I think this is what Paul's saying in terms of these two big rocks, in terms of working out how you organise your life. He's saying, make sure that there are no gods above God. And secondly, live your life on the basis of how it affects other people. Be a blessing to the world. Don't seek to be blessed, but be a blessing. Empathy is not the goal. Just being a, a very empathetic person is not the goal. And Paul makes us understand that deeply when he says ten, in 1031, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That, that ultimately these two planks are actually supporting structures for the main bit of the infrastructure of your life. The main ethic of our life has to be, I want to live for Jesus and every aspect of my life is about him. It's about the glory of God. All of our actions need to be measured on the basis of whether they help the people around us move closer to or further away from God. This is what Paul's saying. Again, I know there's part of you that doesn't want to hear this this morning because we live in a world that says the most important person is you and if other people don't get it, that's their problem. This is part of the miracle that's meant to hold a church together because if a church is full of people who are living for each other, we can hang it together. But if a church is full of people who are living for themselves, it's a nightmare. There is no aspect of your life that's not important, is what Paul's saying. And just to bring it home and to make sure we understand what he's saying, he says, don't cause anyone to stumble whether Jews, Greeks, or the church, or, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. We heard this fantastic testimony earlier in the service and how Paul and Manisha, just coming alongside this fella, changed his life. Don't you want to see more people have their lives changed as they encounter Jesus through us? Living for yourself and seeing people's lives changed by Jesus are mutually exclusive. And Paul rounds this up and leads on to a really complex discussion we'll have next week about the role of ministry of women in the church and how ministry is meant to work, by saying this, follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus. The ultimate example of someone dying to their needs is, of course, Jesus. This is how we bring hope to Hobart. This is how the world actually changes. As the small parts of your life come under Jesus' authority... And people notice. And they ask you about the hope you have. 1 Peter says, In your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Peter is assuming we are living in a way that is noticeably different to everybody else. We are living on the basis of the life that is only through Jesus and we are living for the sake of others, not for ourselves and we don't uh, let the idols' ideas, this is an absolutely confronting truth that Paul is wanting us to hear. Get rid of your idols, live for others for the sake of Jesus and that's how you find life. 
And that's you, you now, as we together now, please, be, please stand here and at home. And as we together say the Lord's Prayer, you watch. It's Jesus managed to encapsulate all that Paul was saying in this very simple and revolutionary prayer. So let's pray together as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Jesus, help this to be true. I pray for my brothers and sisters watching online, for us here at Mornington and and uh, at Lena Valley, help us confront the idols in our lives. Help us not live for ourselves, but for those that you give us in our lives to care for, but ultimately help us live for your glory. We ask this in your name. Amen.